Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Schwartz, and I'm with the Energy Management Association. Thank you so much for logging on today for our webinar, and special thanks to NetNeo Optimizer for sponsoring this particular session. I'm going to go over a few quick housekeeping notes before we enter into the webinar. The presenter today will be holding questions until the end of the presentation, but we do encourage you to submit them at any time using the Q&A button that you see. If you happen to be experiencing any technical issues during the webinar, you can use the chat function to inform the panelists, and then we will do our best to assist you. This presentation is being recorded, and we will send an email out in a week with access to that recording. And then finally, in terms of continuing education credit, everyone in attendance for the full webinar will receive a certificate of attendance sent to their email within 24 hours. So please leave at least a day for that to kick in. So today's webinar, Increasing Building Performance and Resiliency Through Simplified Energy Modeling. And we have Doug Wilf here joining us from, um, from Neo Net Energy Optimizer. He is the Director of Software at Wildan with 13 years of experience in development and delivery of utility demand side management programs. And during the past eight years, he has been leading the development of, of the software platforms, including Neo and also the B3 benchmarking platform, which you may be familiar with. He's a professional engineer and a proud alum of Iowa State University. So with that, thank you again for taking time out of the day to hop on another webinar with EMA. And I'm going to kick it off to Doug to get us started. Doug? All right. Thank you, Sam. I uh, appreciate the introduction. I'm going to take over the screen share here. Uh, so we're here today, as Sam mentioned, we're going to talk about increasing building performance and resiliency through simplified energy modeling. So that's a topic that gives us a lot to unpack. So uh, we're going to start off by uh, talking about uh, what is an energy model. Uh, we'll move into talking a little bit about how the electric grid is evolving uh, today and into the future and the role that energy modeling can play in helping to address uh, some of the issues that we see coming uh, on, from the grid. Uh, and then we'll focus more in on what is simplified modeling, um, why it's needed and, and the benefits of it. Uh, we'll talk about case studies, as well as uh, what to look for in simplified modeling tools. And then we'll draw a few conclusions and the same mentioned, get into some question and answers towards the end. So uh, there's, a, like I said, a lot to unpack here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so what is energy modeling? An energy model is a mathematical model that represents the physical and operational characteristics of a building. Um, it takes the physical design, the operations, pairs it with uh, weather data, and then runs through a simulation uh, that goes through incremental time steps. Those could be as low as five or 15 minutes up to what's typically uh, an hour time step through a simulation. And it does a calculation of, within the building, uh, calculating thermal loads and energy flows at each time step. So it's a very powerful, very, very granular calculation that's done within these energy models uh, to estimate energy savings of a building. Once you have an energy model, uh, you can start to do some analysis. So with just a single model, you might be able to uh, run loads calculations understand what equipment sizes need to be to, uh, for air conditioning, heating, um, air flows, as well as uh, it'll give you a sense of energy consumption estimates. So you'll have an, an understanding of how much building, how much energy uh, the building might use, um, as well as how that usage breaks down to the different end uses. So um, plug loads versus lighting versus uh, heating and cooling and fans and all of that. But where energy modeling can get really powerful is through comparative analysis and multiple models. So you take your one energy model and you tweak it a little bit, change some of the physical characteristics or maybe some of the operational characteristics and look at the results. How does that, how do those results change when I make that, that tweak? Uh, this leads to different types of analysis such as goal setting, massing analysis, which is a comparison of a building's form factor 
um, its shape, shading, things of that nature. Uh, you can do HVAC system comparisons with total cost of ownership calculations. You can look at energy efficiency opportunities or it might be in the form of like product comparisons. Um, what happens if I upgrade my lighting fixtures to lighting fixture A versus lighting fixture B? What does that mean in terms of total energy use? Also renewable energy, code compliance and green building certification are also uh, commonly looked at. It's also important to understand the impact of using energy models. Uh, the AIA 2030 commitment runs a report each year uh, by the numbers report. And in 2019, they saw that uh, projects that used energy modeling on average saved 32% more energy than projects that didn't use energy modeling. So it's, it's a very effective way of uh, pushing a design or, or pushing a building's uh, uh, equipment to be more efficient and to do so cost effectively. So you can save a lot of energy if you use an energy model, it can help you have a better building. Uh, but then there's also this gap in the market. Uh, so the same report from AIA uh, shows that less than 50% of all projects are, are receiving an energy model or about 61% if you look at it in terms of total square footage. So while energy modeling is the most effective way to optimize energy efficiency in buildings, it is still very much underused. And we'll get into some of the reasons why that is a little bit later on, uh, but just kind of under, good to understand um, kind of where the market's at today. So with an endless design solution for any given project, energy modeling, is key to evaluate and compare options and optimize building design. Uh, designers and building owners often experience choice overload. Uh, when we don't have the adequate information, we need to make decisions. We default to what we know, what we're comfortable with, what we've done before, or what might be minimally required, be it uh, codes or prerequisites. Um, alternatively, there may not be enough choices available uh, if a project is very late in design or a construction schedule is very compressed uh, and it's moving too fast to perform any kind of meaningful energy analysis. So that's a quick overview of energy modeling, but wanted to make sure that we all had a kind of a common understanding there. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the evolving electric grid. Um, our, our, our energy problems today are a bit different than they were maybe even just 10 years ago. Uh, it's not a simple solution of just reducing energy use. Uh, it's more nuanced than that. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit more about that. So every moment of every day, the amount of electricity being used needs to be nearly exactly balanced with the amount of electricity being generated, or the grid ends up with voltage fluctuations that might damage equipment or cause blackouts. Um, this balancing act has been managed by independent system operators or commonly called ISOs. These are folks that sit in giant control rooms monitoring the voltage at various points in the grid. And they bring generation up and down uh, to, to match the load and keep the voltage at that right level. And that spinning reserve, that ramping up or down is typically done with natural gas because the natural gas power plants can ramp up and down generation quickly. And the grid from 1884 until recently uh, consisted of large fossil fuel, hydro and nuclear power plants that generate electricity, transmit it to an area it's needed, and then distribute it to individual buildings. That transmission could flow in either direction, but distribution almost always went in one direction. Generation would be throttled up or down, as I talked about, based on the voltage, uh, which Kind of funny that it was originally measured by how bright the light bulb was in the control room. Um, but with the, the dramatic drop in price of wind, solar, storage, uh, and the electrification of heating systems and transportation, uh, that, that dynamic on the grid is changing. The grid of 2030 is going to be a lot different uh, than the grid we've had the last 100 years. Uh, Electricity production is increasingly distributed 
And with variable renewable uh, generation, it's gonna vary based on the weather. Uh, today, it's cheaper to build new wind and solar energy than to pay for even just the fuel of existing coal or natural gas power plants in a lot of instances. Um, and additionally, distributed generation and storage means that now electricity is flowing in multiple directions throughout the grid. So uh, widespread solar is, is changing that load shape uh, that grid operators are seeing. Um, a lot of you might recognize uh, this image. It wouldn't be a presentation about energy without it. It's the famous California duck curve. Uh, so uh, in California, where solar is mandated on new residential buildings, they have high electric prices and nice sunny days makes for a, a short payback on solar. So there's been a ton of investment in solar, which is great. Um, and grid operators have seen a dramatic change uh, in the midday energy demand net of solar. So the curve that you're seeing is how much generation that the uh, fossil fuel based power plants need to provide to keep track with the demand. Uh, between 4 and 7 p.m. you see that very steep ramp up and it's getting it's just been getting steeper and steeper over the years. The solar output begins to drop right before the peak load of the day around 6 p.m. So the variable solar needs to be balanced with either dispatchable power generation or some uh, type of flexible demand. Uh, although this is all focused on California right now, you know, continued ad adoption of solar, it's getting less and less expensive. It'll, it'll bring it, this problem to a grid near you. Um, but it's not all ducks. I am uh, I'm based out of Minnesota, uh, so we can also see some of this dynamic uh, in the Midwest with our wind-driven load shape. Um, the we are part of the, the Midwest Independent System Operator, and our load shape has been dubbed the Smiling Alligator by Fresh Energy. Um, wind speeds vary across the day, but it's typically strongest at night. Um, and wind generation can rapid, change rapidly with weather fronts. So the graph on the right shows that MISO North region uh, on a day in, in 2017. You can see the, the blue line here is the, is the total load. The wind generation is in yellow. And the gray is, is net load. So that's the difference between the blue and the yellow lines. Looking at the wind generation for a moment, you can see that at about 6 p.m., uh, a weather front came through and wind generation dropped 8,000 megawatts, bounced back in a few hours later up to 4,000, and then dropped again. Uh, you can see what the grid, uh, the ISO had to do to try to keep track with that as far as you know, ramping up and down uh, those natural gas plants uh, to, to maintain their voltage on, on the grid. Uh, that type of event can give the ISO whiplash as they try to, to balance the load and generation. And oftentimes that results in very high electric prices during a time like this. So all of these factors mean things are getting much more complicated for independent system operators. They continue to need to balance system loads and generation in a system that has many more variables at play. Their old methods of maintaining that balance will be insufficient soon, uh, so they need some new solutions. Let's, those solutions, uh, some of them have nothing to do with, with buildings. Um, we can take a look at those here. Might be uh, building more distribution, uh, better distribution systems, more peaking plants, those natural gas plants that need to ramp up and down with load, uh, grid integrated storage, uh, batteries, or overproduction. All of these solutions require a lot more infrastructure, a lot of capital costs, it's very expensive. Um, the solutions at our disposal within buildings themselves are actually some of the most cost-effective ways to address these problems. Uh, and one of the first ways uh, we can address this is by focusing on efficiency first. Um, by focusing on energy efficiency within a building, you're minimizing your capital costs and uh, on the building itself, uh, especially for like buildings that are trying to achieve 
uh, very low carbon or net zero, um, minimizes grid infrastructure, while also you know improving occupant comfort, um, fewer drafts, warmer cooler systems, generally better buildings. Um, but as you in invest in energy efficiency within a building, the more the further you try to push it, the longer your return on investment gets with that with that efficiency. So at some point, we find that typically that's around 50 to 60 percent uh, better than than code. Uh, at some point, the the efficiency becomes less cost effective than uh, adding renewable energy to a project. Uh, but as codes change, solar becomes less expensive. That kind of that dynamic is going to shift. But it's important to kind of keep in mind as you try to upgrade a building, make it more efficient. Um, you know, sometimes you know looking at uh, renewable energy might be your next best option. Um, there's a lot going on here, but I do want to, I'll, I'll try to walk us through it as best I can. Um, every year, the British consulting firm Lazard does an estimate of the levelized and unsubsidized cost of different forms of energy generation. Uh, levelized means the total costs, including uh, building the the, the plant, the fuel to, to for the generation and maintenance is spread over all of the generation. It allows conventional systems to be compared to renewable systems that have much lower ongoing costs because they don't have the fuel component. Um, the bars here are cost ranges for different technologies and some of the, the orange diamonds you'll see uh, are the ongoing costs after an asset has been fully depreciated. So it's kind of the, the fuel only, fuel and maintenance costs of uh, natural gas, coal, or nuclear plants. Uh, so as you can see here, the, the cheapest energy are, are wind and utility sales scale solar. Uh, but rooftop commercial and industrial uh, and community scale solar are, are still competitive with fossil fuel and nuclear technologies. Um, now, Lazard doesn't consider energy efficiency as an energy source. Um, so I've added a range here at the bottom uh, for comparison's sake. Um, and as you can see, it is the least expensive energy source at the low end um, and ramps up uh, to be competitive with, with solar, as we just talked about kind of on the higher end. So the argument here is, is that we should, you know, try to meet our energy needs at that lowest total cost in carbon. We should buy all of the, the $15 per, per megawatt hour efficiency that we can. Uh, but then as the levelized cost gets higher, we should start buying wind and solar. Those investments minimize the capital costs and, and carbon emissions as well. Uh, gas peaking plants are expensive per megawatt hour um, that they provide, but for now, they're still sometimes uh, the least expensive way to meet that late afternoon demand surge and should be, in those cases, probably more appropriately compared to storage options because uh, they may only be out, operated for a few hours a day. Uh, so decarbonizing requires a lot of investment and I call it, I'm not calling it expensive because, uh, you know, we really need to look at it as an investment because it will save us a tremendous amount of costs and environmental catastrophe uh, in the long run. But most decarbonization technologies, whether uh, renewables or efficiency, um, have larger upfront costs, but significantly less ongoing costs than, than our conventional approaches. So then the next question is, you know, how do we how do we measure a building's impact on the on this new dynamic grid? Um, how do I make sure that my building is an asset to the grid rather than a liability on the grid? Um, the Grid Optimal Building Initiative is an effort led by the New Buildings Institute, uh, developed metrics for buildings to measure how they would contribute to solving or exasperating those, those grid challenges. Um, so it takes inputs from some of the national labs as far as hourly uh, carbon profiles based on location, um, as well as hourly grid data um, based on location. And we can use that to try to measure um, how, how well a building interacts with the grid. 
So I'll talk about a few of these metrics. Um, first one, grid peak, grid peak contribution is the degree to which building uh, demand contributes to load on the grid during system peak hours. On-site renewable util utilization efficiency is about a building's consumption of renewable energy generated on site over a year. So, you know, we don't want buildings to be generating a ton of electricity and trying to export it to the grid. It's not efficient and actually makes uh, some of those grid dynamics even worse. Um, so we want the energy generated on site to be used on site. Grid carbon alignment, how well does the building's energy usage profile align with uh, clean energy on the, available on the grid? Energy efficiency versus baseline. Short-term demand flexibility, which is a building's ability to reduce demand for an hour. Long-term demand flexibility makes that four hours. Dispatchable flexibility is more of an automated approach that might reduce demand for just 15 minutes at a time, generally controlled directly by a utility or third party. And then the last one here, resiliency, which is a building's ability to island from the grid or provide energy for critical loads for maybe four hours, maybe 24 hours. How well does that building perform um, in a situation where maybe there's a, a power outage? So let's talk about some strategies to consider that might be different than things you would consider when just looking at reducing energy costs. Um, if you wanna build a building that's more friendly with, with the grid, more grid interactive, uh, you might do things like face solar, some of your solar panels towards the west to provide some late afternoon generation, kind of slowing the slope of that um, late afternoon uh, net demand profile from the, if we think about the duck curve again. You might look at HVAC equipment that includes automated demand response um, or lighting systems or service water heating that includes automated demand response uh, that you can then integrate directly with your utility, receive signals to reduce demand. Um, that helps the grid and also a lot of times those types of programs uh, offered by the utility result in you know, lower energy costs because uh, due to the rate structure or even incentives uh, from the utilities. Uh, a building can try to use energy when renewable, the renewable energy is available. So preheating hot water to higher temperatures or pre-cooling apartments um, in the mid afternoon rather than waiting till five or six at night. Um, we can design efficient building shells that coast through demand response events. The image on the right on this slide is uh, a design competition or, or challenge held in LA and Seattle, excuse me. Um, one, one was built to passive house standards and another one was built to title 24 standards, which is energy code in California. Each building was filled with 500 pounds of ice and they were left to sit for seven days. The passive house uh, uh, building with its high, uh, highly efficient envelope uh, stayed at 70 degrees after seven days while the Title 24 box, uh, the code minimum box was sitting at 92 degrees. So that passive house type of a design um, allows for much more demand flexibility in heating and cooling loads. Uh, and then the last thing here is to minimize winter peak demand. And we'll take a look at, at this as well. Um, especially important in heating dominated climates as we look to electrify uh, the heating systems within our buildings. Uh, we wanna be considering things like uh, ground coupling heat pumps. So that we're using a, a well field or uh, uh, as a thermal battery of sorts to improve our, our heat pump uh, efficiency. This provides a lot, very good uh, increases in efficiency year round, but does have that large capital cost up front. Um, there's battery storage, thermal storage, uh, which might include things like phase change materials or uh, ice storage, improving building envelopes, as we just talked about, and uh, using, utilizing gas backup. So instead of electric resistance or electric strip heating uh, to, to back up your heat pumps, um, provide some natural gas at those times because it it's those peak, peak morning hours during winter uh, that are gonna be uh, very unwieldy for, for grid operators to manage and for utilities to provide enough power. 
Okay, so we talked about what an energy modeling, what an energy model is, why it's important. Um, we talked about kind of this evolving energy grid and uh, what the problems are today and into the future and what we need to do to try to address uh, some of these problems. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about now simplified modeling, uh, why it's needed and the barriers that uh, mo energy modeling typically face and how simplified modeling helps us overcome those barriers. So for those that aren't familiar, energy modeling requires a fair amount of expertise and, and experience uh, to be able to do it, to do it well. Um, so with that comes a consultant typically with traditional energy modeling. Um, that consultant can be expensive and, that can, and those traditional tools uh, can take a lot of time. So in the case of small teams and small budgets, uh, you know, the traditional energy modeling, uh, th these projects might not have access to that energy expert, or they might not have enough time in their process to be able to do the uh, deep energy analysis and integrate those decisions into their design and stay on, on schedule for construction. So simplified modeling provides a solution here uh, because of how quickly, um, energy analysis can be done with these tools. Um, they, are, they are validated in a number of different ways, um, but know, knowing that you can trust the results, so that, you know you, the, the level of expertise isn't, isn't what it's required for traditional tools and is much more affordable. Uh, being able to do some of the energy analysis yourself or even just in less time helps reduce the cost of, uh, of energy modeling. Projects with, with short schedules and no time, um, you know, again, the small, small buildings that are looking to, you know, finish construction in, in a matter of months, large projects that maybe are just late in their design and they're running out of time, simplified modeling el eliminates these barriers in, in how quickly they're able to provide energy analysis. Uh, their ease of use and versatility means that they can be uh, used to answer questions and. Uh, design questions or project questions in a lot of different ways. Uh, the last one here is uh, the uncertainty in predictive analysis. So, and that's an energy model is, a, is, is predictive in its nature. It's an estimate of what energy use will be for a building. Um, and because of that, it, you know, it's not guaranteed to be 100% accurate. Um, that uncertainty leads to a lack of trust. Um, also the, you know, it, it is hard to find uh, that energy expert to, to build a reliable and trustworthy energy model. Um, so energy modeling again can play a hand, simplified energy modeling can play a hand in, in addressing these barriers um, through, through the, the tools themselves. They provide guardrails to keep uh, users from making uh, painful mistakes. Um, so they're, they're accurate and again, valid. So the barriers on the left here, we talked about the lack of expertise, short timelines, small budgets, and uncertainty can all be addressed through simplified modeling. And additionally, on top of that, we've got this new grid interactive building concept coming uh, and really is here today. Um, you need the granularity of an energy model to be able to do this kind of analysis because you need to be able to look hour by hour uh, how a building is going to use energy, how that compares to the dynamics of the grid, and be able to gauge whether a building is going to be that a grid asset or a grid liability. So the hourly data out of an energy model can be used in this way to, to calculate those grid optimal metrics. Helps you understand the impacts of the demand responsiveness and demand flexibility. How does energy efficiency play a role hour by hour and how my building interacts with the dynamics of the grid? And then wrap in on-site generation and storage to look at what is my net demand and what am I doing to the grid? And uh, next we'll get into these case studies. So we wanna look, take a look at what to look for in simplified modeling tools and also uh, take a quick look at a project example that used leverage a simplified tool. So we've been developing, uh, we've been doing energy modeling for uh, almost 40 years. 
Uh, we've been developing tools to, in support of it for uh, just about as long. Uh, in, in 2010, we took our first cut at trying to simplify energy modeling, speed it up. Uh, it was very spreadsheet driven. We used pre-run energy models based on prototype buildings to try to estimate energy use. Um, and then a, a lot of spreadsheet magic to make it all work. Um, so architects or engineers, uh, energy decision makers would be able to understand what they would need to do in a building, uh, in a building's design to be able to uh, hit their energy goals. We did 131 projects over three years with this tool. Um, it was a su success in that these projects that started early on did this, went through this goal setting exercise. Um, we're able to average savings of 45% compared to just 30% for projects starting during design. But the tool itself was unwieldy to manage and update. Uh, we are always on the lookout for new building types, expanding to other climate zones, different prototype sizes. Um, it made for a, a real challenge. So in 2013, we took a second attempt. With this time, rather than relying on prototype pre-run models, we started doing real-time cloud-based energy modeling, supporting multiple energy codes, a lot of different mechanical systems. Um, we had inputs like building size or square footage, uh, a number of different building types again, uh, able to model a number of different floors, multiple HVAC system types. And it was used on 165 pro projects in 2014. But the biggest hang up with this that we learned was um, that to model a building, building type was not granular enough. We all can think of an office building. An office building is an office building, right? Uh, well, not really. And actually what we learned was the further we got into it, the more projects we started to do, every, off every building is kind of its own little unique thing. Um, offices that have large data centers or large cafeterias in them or a, a school project that you may call a school, but is really just a, an auditorium. Uh, so we needed to be more flexible in how we did our modeling. And that led us to uh, our third attempt, which we're, uh, we've been developing and continue to build on today. Um, it involves, instead of thinking of things in terms of a building type, we think of the key functional areas within a building. We call them space asset types. Uh, these have been uh, very successful in terms of being able, allowing us to build a model uh, of a lot of, of almost any building that's, that's out there, especially in the commercial space. Um, you can block and stack these areas, um, assign HVAC systems uh, to, be, to serve them. Um, we've got a library of energy codes, libraries of utility rates, uh, thousands of weather files across the country, and more flexibility to be able to fine tune again what's going on within that building. So an office building is an office building, right? Well, not really because sometimes an office building is nine to five, sometimes it's 24 hour operation like a call center. Um, so we need, we have flexibility to be able to adjust for those kinds of important inputs that are gonna drive the energy use and create a quality energy model. And we've done, we did 500 projects in 2015. Uh, we're doing over uh, about a thousand a year uh, today. Um, we're reducing modeling time per project by about 75% and, and we support new and existing buildings so we can do new construction or facilitate energy audits with our energy models. Um, and this is really what it all boils down to. We make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, so again, our space asset types, those functional areas, they make what is a school, break that down. It, a school is made of classrooms admin areas, media center, stacks and reading, uh, an auditorium, a gym. That kind of flexibility really allows uh, to, to build a custom model for every project. You can adjust geometry, uh, capture the, the space and the layout of a building. Again, operating schedules I mentioned. HVAC systems, to simplify enough to make it uh, quickly definable, but um, but powerful enough that we can capture a lot of the different building types or a lot of the different HVAC system types that are out there. So central heating and cooling plants, district uh, district systems, as well as the airside systems like central VAV or, or VRF. 
And then the last thing to think about in terms of uh, looking when you're looking at a simplified modeling tool is to consider uh, some of the other automation that can come into play. One important piece would be uh, an ability to run energy efficiency measures, or we call them strategies, um, and to run these automatically so a user doesn't have to configure them and spend a lot of time manipulating. And, and to run, have the strategy list be comprehensive so that you're evaluating uh, energy efficiency opportunities across mechanical, architectural, lighting, plug loads, and water heating. Um, so, um, last time we're going to shift gears, we're going to get into a quick case study of a project, uh, Myron Construction Company's regional office uh, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's about 12,000 square foot office building. We wanted to be high performing, healthy, modern. You know, they're a construction company. They want to show off their capabilities and, and their company culture. But it's a small building with a quick construction schedule. So traditional energy modeling was a challenge both in terms of time and budget. Uh, so Myron's project team utilized NEO uh, while analyzing their energy use. They had uh, lead certification goals that they were trying to achieve. Uh, simplified modeling tools can quickly adjust to modifications during the design process. So there's a lot of iteration, a lot of back and forth. How do we optimize energy efficiency in, within our budget? Um, so that, that simplified modeling uh, facilitates a lot of that and help them uh, achieve the, the best return on investment for their project. Um, and at the end of the day, their design included uh, equipment such as ground coupled heat pumps, uh, air side heat recovery, high performance envelope and lighting. Uh, they achieved over $13,000 in energy cost savings, uh, which is about 42, 43% of their total estimated energy use. Uh, they ultimately earned 16 points under the lead energy credits. Um, and maybe worth noting that you know, without an energy model, lead kind of caps what you can do in terms of claiming those credits. They would have only been able to, at, a, at the most, achieve a maximum of six points. So it turned out to be a, a, you know, a successful project uh, for their team. Um, and a, this is just a quick uh, testimonial from, from a team member there, just uh, attesting to the, the cost effectiveness and time effectiveness that simplified modeling provided them. So uh, to conclude, uh, modeling is underutilized. Uh, the top 2% of firms that are submitting projects to the AIA 2030 challenge are modeling less than 50% of their buildings today. Um, even though those, the projects that are modeled are shown to save more than 30, 35% or more uh, than the non-model projects. More modeling means more informed decisions for new and existing building projects, which supports our decarbonization goals and aligns with that changing energy grid. And then lastly, simplified modeling makes modeling accessible, accurate, and affordable while allowing us to address the decarbonization issues of today and tomorrow. So uh, thank you all for, for attending. Uh, appreciate your attention. Uh, some contact information if you want to reach out. I'm all ears, um, but I think we can probably open it up for some questions. Okay, thank you so much, Doug. So get the questions, jumping right in. Um, someone's asking if a ground source heat pump would work with simplified energy modeling. It can. Uh, so simplified energy modeling tools can model ground, ground coupled heat pumps. Um, we certainly support it within ours. Um, the it, it especially important is the comparative analysis that that you're doing. So you're saying, uh, you know, I have a building that's very representative of my actual building. Um, what? How does that building perform with uh, with a ground source heat pump? How does it perform versus a traditional system? Do that comparison, and that'll give you a sense of whether that kind of a system is cost effective for you. Okay, and another person is asking, what kind of expertise do they need in order to utilize these types of tools? 
Uh, that's a good question. So I talked about traditional modeling requiring a lot of expertise, uh, traditional energy modelers, um, those consultants are, are, you know, they're architects, engineers, uh, building science experts. Um, to use a simplified modeling tool, it's, it's more about you have a fundamental understanding of how a building uses energy, how a building works. Uh, it, you don't have to know, have the expertise to be able in the tools themselves to be able to use it, which is oftentimes what, uh, where the hang up is in terms of, of the expertise required. Okay, um, another one just came in. Are you able to model a diabetic um, hybrid cooling towers versus conventional cooling water towers? Uh, that's a good question for our tool today. Uh, we we don't offer that. We do conventional uh, water and cooling towers, but don't get into any any hybrid systems. Certainly, uh, you know we're always under development and looking for uh, you know the next thing uh, and and good energy uh, solutions and and look to integrate as much of that as, as we can. But today we don't do that. And I think this question is in relation to maybe one of your charts. Um, they said they saw that nuclear and coal-fired plants had a lower price point shown in addition to the dark blue bar. Can you explain that more? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so those those additional points that were down uh, further down past the blue bar was the cost to, to of the fuel and maintenance uh, for those uh, types of plants. So just the ongoing cost, not the cost to to build it. So it's a it's a comparison point to show that. Um, even just the cost of the fuel and the maintenance of coal and nuclear plants um, is right about in the same area as uh, that total levelized cost of solar and wind. Hopefully that answers the question. And someone is asking, is there a copy of the slides? Yes, actually check the comment section. There is a link where you can download the slides. They should also be in the invite. And we will also be sending an email in about a week with the recording and also copies to the slides just in case you need them. So the next question was, um, what advantages does your software have over a free energy simulation tool um, such as, and they put eQuest, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, there's there's a few different advantage advantages here. Um, there's the the it's really about the automation of the building of the energy model. So uh, and we do that in a number of different ways um, from the creation of the model itself. Things like uh, simplifying and automating the process of defining the geometry of a building. Um, something that might take you several hours in eQuest, we, you know, is really just done in a matter of, you know, minutes uh, in, in our tool uh, or in uh, and other simplified tools. Um, the, some other areas um, are things like uh, a number of automated code baselines. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's very flexible in terms of being able to generate uh, a building model that equals, you know, a, the latest ASHRAE 90.1 standard, or maybe a, you know, it's something from 10 years ago. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, about 12 different energy codes supported within our tool. Um, and then in, into one of the last things I talked about with uh, what to look for in simplified modeling is the automation of, of energy efficiency measures. So being able to, uh, we have a, a library of smart strategies uh, that know when they're applicable and when to show up and when they're not applicable um, and, and that sort of thing. So all of those things together, um, it's a tool that focuses on energy analysis and the energy comparisons. Um, it generates reports uh, through automation. So you have a Word document as a deliverable and the output, all of those things together can, can shave you know, days off of the process. Thank you, Doug. Um, another attendee is asking, are error bars presented with the options presented? And they put in quotations, be they energy savings or on-site production, um, such as for or ROI? Uh, that is a good question. We don't, we don't show any error bars or kind of min or max uh, in any visualizations. It's really, you know, we, we've run a model. That model gives us an estimate. Um, you can certainly do some sensitivity analysis to study if, you know, you 
weak operation or adjust efficiencies up or down, you can see how that changes your energy energy use, but we don't have anything uh, kind of baked in to, to show those error bars. Okay, another attendee is interested in how detailed is the system, for example, on the building envelope, the thermal bridging loss specifically? Uh, so that's a that's a good question. So we have um, we have detailed inputs that allow users in, in different cases to input the the overall U value of a wall assembly. So it, we put it on the user to to determine what that overall U value is. That includes the, uh, the impact of thermal bridging. Okay, and I think this might be the last question that we have. So if anyone else has a question, feel free to submit it. Um, someone's asking, what version of DOE 2 does uh, NEO Net Optimizer use? Um, so NEO uses DOE 2 1E uh, as its simulation engine. Um, it, uh, but we are actually in the process, um, pretty excited uh, to, to, you move to an Energy Plus based simulation engine. Uh, Energy Plus has, um, you know, is what is currently supported by the Department of Energy and the development of energy modeling tools. DO2 is is more of the legacy uh, system, while it, but it has been used for, for years and years for code compliance and lead points and IRS tax credits and those sorts of things. Um, the investment from DOE is all going into Energy Plus, and so we're, good, we're moving our, our simulation engine to that here uh, over the next year or so. Okay, um, so thank you everyone for the questions. Um, Doug, that's that's all of them. So appreciate you coming on with EMA and talking a little bit more about energy modeling. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, so um, for everyone on, we have one more webinar left in the year. It's on understanding, creating, and maintaining a healthy learning environment about how COVID has changed the priorities for facility managers, building owners, and what doing a health and wellness audit can do for your facility. We also have a virtual EMP seminar coming up. This is training course for energy management professional seminar. You can join to go through with the certification process, or you can just join to get educated. It's only $300 for six hours, very good deal. So we hope to see you at both of these events and everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you all.